Good morning. On behalf of Spokane Community College and the Hagen Center for the Humanities, I would like to welcome all of you to our diversity dialogues. With the words, I see you, I hear you, I feel you, I welcome you to sit down with us, all of us at this same table this morning to engage in dialogue about race, about diversity, about equity, and about the arts. We encourage audience participation. If you'd like to ask questions of our guests this morning, please type them into the comments on social media. Or if you're not logged into social media, you can email your questions to scc.hagencenter at scc.spokane.edu. Our moderators will forward those questions to me and I'll make sure we get to ask our guests as many of those questions as we're able in our time this morning. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce Hilton Owls. He began contributing to The New Yorker in 1989, writing pieces for The Talk of the Town and became a staff writer in 1994, the theater critic in 2002 and lead theater critic in 2012. He brings to the magazine a rigorous, sharp and lyrical perspective on acting, playwriting and directing. And with his deep knowledge of the history of performance, not only in theater, theater but in dance music and the visual arts, he shows us how to view a production and how to place its director, its author, and its performers in the ongoing continuum of dramatic art. His reviews are not just reviews, they are provocative contributions to the discourse on theater, race, class, sexuality, and identity in America. He's currently working on a new book titled I Don't Remember, a book length essay on his experiences in AIDS era New York. Before going to The New Yorker, he was a staff writer for The Village Voice and an editor at large at Vibe. His first book, The Women, was published in 1996. His book, White Girls, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in 2014 and winner of the 2014 Lambda Literary Award for nonfiction and discusses various narratives of race and gender. His in-progress debut play, Lives of the Performers, has been performed at Carolina Performing Arts and Lax Art in Los Angeles. Still developing through a series of workshops, the play examines race, sisterhood, the self, and the forces that threaten to destroy it. In 1997, the New York Association of Black Journalists awarded Al's first prize in both Magazine Critique Review and Magazine Arts and Entertainment. He was awarded a Guggenheim for Creative Writing in 2000 and the George Jean Nathan Award for Dramatic Criticism for 2002. In 2016, he received the Lambda Literary's Trustee Award for Excellence in Literature as well as the Wyndham Campbell Prize for Nonfiction. In 2017, he won the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism, and in 2018, the Langston Hughes Medal. In 2020, he was named an inaugural Presidential Visiting Scholar at Princeton University for the academic year, and he was voted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2009, Owls worked with the performer Justin Bond on Cold Water, an ex exhibition of paintings, drawings, and videos by performers at La Mama Gallery. In 2010, he co-curated Self-Consciousness in Berlin and published Justin Bond, Jackie Curtis. In 2015, he collaborated with the artist Celia Paul to create Desdemona for Celia by Hilton, an exhibition for the Metropolitan Opera's Gallery Met. In 2016, his debut art show, One Man Show, Holly, Candy, Bobby, and the Rest opened at the Artist Institute. He also curated Alice Neal Uptown and God Made My Face, a collective portrait of James Baldwin at the David Zorner Gallery in New York City. He's curating three successive solo exhibitions at the Yale Center for British Art. The first exhibit in 2018 featured Celia Paul. The second in 2019 features Lynette Yadam Boyake, the third will feature Paul Doig. In 2019, he partnered with WNYC's Green Space in a limited podcast series titled The Way We Live Now, Hilton Owls and America's Poets. He contributed an essay to Moonlight, a limited edition book about the film of the same name. He's currently an associate professor of writing at Columbia University School of the Arts and has taught at Yale University, Wesleyan and Smith College. He currently lives in New York City. Hilton, you are probably the um of, of in our series this year somebody who has the widest range of experiences as a writer and an artist and a critic um, and i wanted to make sure that our primarily student audience today really understood the breadth and depth of all of that work that you've done so thank you so much for joining us this no I'm, I'm i'm it's a thrill to be here and it's i wish i could be in spokane i've never been so hopefully one day i'll, I'll get to see you all in, in person that would be wonderful. Um, you said it's quite warm this morning in New York. Yes. Um, yes, and it's quite warm here today as well. So maybe <laughs> is, that a, is that unusual in Spokane? 
Uh, somewhat, yes. Um, yeah. We get hot weather, but not this early in the year. So we're yeah. all, we're all, we all think that we're suffering today. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's start out this morning and tell us, could you tell our audience a little bit about your childhood and your path to becoming a writer and an artist? Sure. Um, I was I was raised in Brooklyn, New York, in a section of Brooklyn um, called East New York, which is um, towards, if you've ever been to New York, it's the way that you go towards uh, JFK. And it's a section of, of Brooklyn called Brownsville. And it used to be um, in the 19th century, primarily Jewish, uh, Russian immigrants, etc. And then in the 50s um, and 60s, black families started moving in. And it was a way for um, people of, um, to have a little bit of property. Um, a lot of the Jews, uh, Jewish family and Jews that we knew were moving out to the suburbs um, in the 60s. And so we lived in this little house. I was raised um, by my mother. My parents never lived together, even though they were together. Um, my father lived with his mother. Um, so the arrangement, um, I didn't know that I didn't know that couples lived together until I was 13 years old. I remember a friend taking me through her uh, parents' house and I kept saying, this is very, that's very nice. Um, where does your father sleep? Um, it never occurred to me that your father stayed in the same bed. Um, I had four older sisters who had a big effect on me and a younger brother. Um, and then when we were, I was around, Eight. Uh, this just occurred to me. I started writing, and at the same time, around I was starting to write around six or seven, and simultaneously, my mother started to get ill. Um, she had a. Uh, um, it's interesting. A lot of women of color. It's a sarcoidosis. It's a lung disease, and uh, and so she, my brother and I had to live with various relatives. And I think that this had a big effect on both of us. Um, it made us very close, but it also made us, um, <clears throat> I think, um, want to stay put on some level. Um, but I always, I started writing around the same time. I didn't realize that until I was talking to you, um, <clears throat> Gwendolyn. And I, the writing was, um, a way for me, I always say that I grew up, since I grew up in a family of women, writing was a way for me to get a word in edgewise. Um, it was a way for me to have my thoughts and in a, in a voluble household. And I wrote before I read, really. Um, it was the expression of language that I couldn't express. Um, it was the ex that I couldn't express in, in uh, the world. It was a, it was a way of communicating um, ideas, really, for me, and and fantasies and thoughts almost immediately. And so um, it always was what Tennessee Williams called his cave and his refuge. And for me, it was always that. And then I started to read, not really until I was ten or eleven, and I loved books um, and started to devour them as Baldwin, James Baldwin says, like some weird food when he was a kid. And um, it made me feel less alone as a queer person. It made me feel um, it made me feel that I wanted to do something connected to the larger world of literature. Um, which is vast and you, and I sort of wanted to be part of that vastness and understanding of other people. Um, so it's just a real, it's a very interesting feeling um, to, to be a writer, I think, because it connects you not only to what your experience is, but to yourself. Thank you mm -hmm. for sharing that insight. I had not 
really thought about the aspect of growing up um, in a household of women and yeah. <laughs> trying to get away. I love them all. Friends. They're great. But there was a lot of talking. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. You yourself, you work as an essayist and as an artist, but you also write literary and artistic criticism, theater criticism. How are your approaches to those two different tasks, both the production of art, literature, et cetera, and then the critique? How are they similar and different? In other words, how do those two parts of your creative and intellectual life talk to one another? You know, it's funny. I was, I've been thinking about this a lot. Someone asked me this recently, and I think it has something to do with writing as a kind of register that each of us as writers and thinkers has a different register in our voice. Um, so the soprano might sing bel canto, but she also sings jazz and um, many different kinds of forms of music. And I think that um, just amazing kind of feeling, you know, uh, of being able to play. In, in registers. I think that one of the, the difficult things about writing, like any creative endeavor, is that you have to relax in order for it to um, be in the world with you. So I think that one of the things that happens, why writers should walk or you know tend a garden or something is it actually helps you relax in order to have language. So for me, I don't really see the difference so much as I hear the difference in register. Um, you know, if it's a New Yorker piece, there are certain things that you have to let the reader know, like where the thing is. And um, But if it's writing for you, you know where you are. You don't have to explain, but you also have this kind of beautiful, um, exploration of your many, many different selves in one experience, you know? The one experience of your voice. I like that, that analogy of the different register. That makes, that makes sense. Thank you, that, that, that's very helpful. How has your approach to writing changed over these years in your career? Um, Say that one more time, Gwen, it's a good question and I wanna really give you a, a proper answer. How has your approach to writing changed? Oh. In the time you've been writing? I think that I've gotten more disciplined as I've become aware of time, um, doesn't stand still. And um, I think that I've become much more disciplined because I realize how much I wanna say and that we have um, we have a limited amount of time to say it. So I think that one of the things that we can do that is very important um, one of the things that's very important is that we have this experience of giving ourselves permission every day to do it. I think that, um, you know, someone like Gertrude Stein, vast amount of work, or Virginia Woolf, um, these, Henry James, these are people who worked every day. And it is something that I found um, is very helpful to sort of tap into it. You know, Gertrude Stein only wrote half an hour every day, but it was a half an hour every day. And so my feeling is that there's, there has to be something, it's almost like a meditation or a prayer um, that you want to give to your characters or to yourself every day. That's how I feel about it that it's sort of honoring the craft, you know?
tell us what it's like to be a writer at the New Yorker. I think for some of our students and maybe even our other audience, that sounds like a dream job, but I'm sure it has its challenges. Sure. It's, it's, um, I was, um, introduced to the New Yorker by a great writer named Ian Frazier. Um, I had, written a piece about him for the Village Voice. And he said, you should write for the New Yorker. And he took me there. And, um, and I'm internally grateful to him. And there's an, also the literary editor of the New Yorker is a man named Henry Finder, whom had, who had also known me and was very generous and important um in my becoming a writer there so that's just my that was my luck and then on the other hand there's once you once you start to do stuff there you have to produce in order to stay um trying to think of what the word would be Just because you land on the moon doesn't mean that you know you can t relax. Um, it's sort of actually once you land in a place like that, you have to prove yourself and to um, come forward with a kind of um, imaginative um, intelligence, but also a great deal of energy. And I think I was very lucky to have people there interested in me um, and to let me develop and make mistakes and, um, and to bring something to the magazine that hadn't been there before, which is a lot of stories about people of color, um, marginalized people, not famous people, situations about New York that were beautiful um, and ephemeral. And so, um, working there is hard work, but it's also an incredible platform um, to discuss things about the city that I love. So you also teach. How do those experiences inform your work as a writer and how does your writing inform your teaching? Oh God, the teaching is crucial. Um, to my development. Um, the great thing about smart students is that you can't fib. You can't lie about anything. Um, you're totally exposed. And you also have um, you also have a kind of um, I think that students give us a kind of grace, really, um, in that they are vulnerable to us. But what is little talked about is how vulnerable we are to them and how much we owe them. And so they are a really perfect and great audience in terms of how do we think, why are we thinking? Um, and because it's, it's a symposium, structure it's about conversation and it's about going to different parts of your mind um and and ability it really takes you to different places it's 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 beautiful i find it enriching i find it um provocative and i find it to be something that makes us vibrant and alive. So yes, it feeds the, for sure it feeds the writing in terms of the um, intellectual inquiry, but also just not to stay put in one ideology or thought, um, that you can have lots of different thoughts and feelings and A student will call you on them. It's great. And then so that feeds your writing. I remember reading 
not too long ago, you described a moment when a student at Columbia, uh, I think the, the, the expression that the student used is described James Baldwin as being really shady. Right. And at the moment it made you laugh. It made me laugh when I read it. Can you talk a little bit about that moment and what it meant to you as a teacher and as someone who is probably as a teacher and a writer must feel an obligation or be presented an obligation to speak as a black writer or as a black right. teacher. That's interesting. I think that um, once we have, I think we need to be freer in our minds and in our hearts about who we are and who we, what we mean to other people. I, I hope in my lifetime to see more connection based on the humanness of a person um, as opposed to um, what we look like or how we're supposed to feel because we look a certain way or it's a great hope of mine that we begin to understand each other as human humans and that um, diversity means really that and that feminism means um, humanism, um, and that um, Black Lives Matter, of course they do. And all of those slogans are ways of thinking that I feel that are not, that become ideological very quickly. I would like to see those walls come tumbling down. So as a teacher and a creator of literature, as an essayist, a critic, all of those things, how do you structure your day? Oh, that's such a good question, Gwen. Do um, you mind me calling you Gwen? No, that's absolutely fine. Well, every day begins with watching Wendy Williams. I have to see her um, because she doesn't speak English. She speaks Wendy and um, Something about her feeling of uh, her her bizarreness in a way um, lets me start to dream and then I can start to feel um, to relax, actually, that goes back to the relaxation. Then I sort of clean the apartment a little bit. Um, and, you know, this is sort of what Jane Bowles used to call chewing your cud. And um, I feel very much in tune to um, that doing nothing part of writing before you sit down. And so that really sort of gears up my imagination. Um, sometimes I'll have to get something, groceries or what, something mundane, basically. And then I really feel that I've taken care of the daily life stuff and I can focus. Um, but I think it's important to do stuff that is not really about the writing, but allows you to have, to be contemplative, um, to, to um, spend some time doing the mundane stuff and in the back of your mind, mm -hmm. The work is working. Did that routine changed significantly during the pandemic. I think I worked more just because it was um, a way of not being lonely at night. I was able to, I think, um, it was almost as if writing became a kind of companion, you know? Wonderful. <clears throat> You mentioned a minute ago, you mentioned Wendy Williams and you used the term, you know, kind of bizarre, but you know, there, there's such a creative force there. Mm -hmm. Your own work pushes the boundaries of genre, as many have said. Where do you find the inspiration to keep creating and to keep pushing that, that same envelope, so to speak? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. For sure, the... Um... I've been, I was one of those kids who didn't want things to be forgotten. 
And I think that I still have that feeling often of memory being a propulsive engine for me that um, it's, 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 it's a memory that keeps me um, this not wanting events or people or feelings to be forgotten. I think this goes back to the childhood stuff of writing down observations and thoughts so that um, it's um, an important tool for me. Um, or I'd say something like, um, it's essential to my understanding of what writing is, which is to not forget. So the past, I, I, I was thinking about this this morning, actually, as I was coming in, I don't even know where how to frame this question, like, where is the starting point for this question anymore. Mm. So I'll just phrase it this way, the past several years have been challenging for many of us for so many different reasons. You know, we've got political unrest going on in our own country, racial violence, the rolling back of protections for LGBTQ people, a pandemic, and Again, I don't even know where to frame the beginning of that time, <laughs> but how have you maintained throughout this, these significant challenges, a sense of hope in your work and your daily, daily life? I think that right now, Gwendolyn, I'm, I'm sort of slightly holding my breath that all of this awfulness in, in, in um, Washington and Americans have a tendency to want to forget very quickly. And I don't think, and I hope that we don't forget the last few years. And I'm hoping that we don't forget to have um, a, a deeper understanding of the awful Trump years and the awful violence of those years and the awful racism of those years. I'm putting it all under Trump because why not, but it's sort of a convenient umbrella. And I'm hoping, Gwendolyn, that we have, that we don't forget um, those deaths. And I, I hope that we don't forget anguish of families, white and black, um, because of drug use and because of poverty. We tend to forget very quickly in this country. And it's my hope that we learn how to hold on to the past because of course we're gonna repeat it if we don't. And I'm just hoping for this experience of recalling pain and anguish and effort and the effort that's gone into speaking out um, on these various topics and murders and um, living in a kind of police state. I'm, I'm hoping that we don't forget. Is there a particular moment if you were, you know, when you're teaching in a classroom 10 years from now, five years from now even, is there a particular moment that you would point to that would help to help a future student to understand kind of the gravity of the situation that you have encountered in the last 18 mm -hmm. years? That's a good... Um, I would probably make a dossier of, uh, or a book give them a book of essays about this period. Um, I think it's essential, um, again, that we don't forget. And one way that we can not forget as writers is to write it down and to read. So I would probably do a kind of anthology um, based on the material from this time.
kind of a pivot. Um, what artistic and literary work inspires you these days? What are you listening to? What are you looking at? What are you reading? Well, there's a great, I hope you guys can come to New York at some point this summer. There's a great Alice Neal exhibition at the Met. Um, I'm listening to a young queer rapper named Mika James, Micah James, M-I-C-A-H, G, initial G, James. Um, he, he did some stuff with um, Spank Rock, um, a song called Woo 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 that I love. Um, I think he's super talented. He's performing at the Hammer Museum in LA. Um, and I'm watching The Wire, which I'd never watched um, before. And I think that it's a prescient show um, that it talks about how violence and poverty repeats itself. And it also gives it, it also gives us the, the people that are attached to those acts. Um, I think it's a great show about queerness, Omar, and um, and about love. And I'm incredibly, I think we're so rich in material these days um, that one of the things that this last year has been able to do for us is uh, take us to an extreme understanding of how blessed we are. Um, that we, even if we didn't have the money, and a lot of us didn't have the money, there were ways for us to enter other worlds, whether through books or TV or, or listening to other people on Zoom, so forth. What advice would you give to those who want to explore a life as a writer or in the arts? Courage. <laughs> uh, persistence, courage and persistence. Um, I think that it's a very important um, and industry. It's very important not to give up. And it's very important not to listen to the naysayers. Um, and it's very important to know that you have your, a voice and that that voice is very important to, even if it's important to one person, that's enough. Um, so I'm just, I just wanna give you permission to be tough about your work and to do your work and also treasure it. Treasure the responses, good and bad. Treasure anything you can learn from, grab it. I would imagine, you know, for our, for our students or aspiring writers in our audience, it's perhaps convenient to look at, at someone like yourself and think it must just be easy to become a writer. Um, or that your your pathway must have been easy. What, ah. kind of, what, kind of, what kinds of challenges did you face in your Well, it's funny. I was talking about this with someone the other day, and I said my um, I was someone's secretary until I was nearly forty, um, and there is this idea that there is that we have a um, a chance to um, we don't have second chances in in life. We we have the first chance, which is a belief in ourselves. And I want I think that the essential thing is to believe and to give permission to yourself. Um, it took me many many years to feel that that I could say that honestly. I, I wasn't giving myself permission half the time. And the other half, I was, I, was, um, I was always committed to it, but I didn't know how to move forward and I didn't know how to move myself forward. So I would say for sure, this is your time is right now. Every minute that you're alive and every minute that you wanna write, write um, because there's no second time. 
to do it. There's this time. So please, I encourage you, please, to do that. Truly, there is no, <laughs> there is no second time, is there? Mm -mm. You've worked extensively in collaboration with other writers and artists. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what have those experiences been like? I think they vary. Um, someone like Justin Vivian Bond, um, their meth way of working is very similar to mine. It's very um, playful and they are um, a joy to work with. Um, other people th who will go unnamed um, want the experience to be about themselves and not the collaboration. So I think that it's, a, it's been a mixed bag, but I learned a lot from, um, I learned a lot from all of them, but I would say that increasingly, I like to do it by myself. Um, and that's because it's, um, I think it, this goes back to your previous question. I think that I am giving myself more and more permission to do it, you know? Um, and I think that I liked collaborating in the past, but now I sort of love this idea more of, um, of speaking through my various registers, you know? on my own and i think that that's you know that's a very interesting thing um to face and that you become um more of yourself the the horror the 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 awful thing about time is that it takes time to grow up and it takes time to give yourself uh or allow yourself the strengths that you have, but it's okay. Um, I'm catching up to life now. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to feel like a grown up. I think. Um, yes, I, I think that, that I, I think in some on some level, before Gwendolyn, I was waiting for someone to save me, um, or to marry me away from. Um, Marry me and provide a kind of rescue. Mm -hmm. um, and and I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but why? But it was a pretty convenient fantasy structure um, in terms of um, it actually it's a fantasy structure that keeps you from yourself, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And um, so fantasy can be good, but let's keep it on the page. You know, it's more productive that way. Fair enough, fair enough. A question from our audience. Does oh, the writing ever get easier? A meaning that as you progress in your writing career, does the process become less grueling? No, but it becomes more interesting. Um, and that's because um, you have, you realize the vastness of how much you have to say and excuse me and you have um a limited means of saying it um i think that there's <clears throat> i think for sure um it becomes more interesting um and it's important that it become more interesting so that you have um you have something to face every day, you know, that, that is inexplicable and that it's difficult and, and you, um, it's beautiful to, have, to be perplexed every day, you know, um, solving problems that you feel that you can't solve. It's a very moving thing. That kind of, you know, connects and goes back to what you said about um, you know, sort of waiting to be rescued, that it, it kind of sounds as though the writing experience that you've had or the, the, the life that you've lived and being able to kind of maybe compartmentalize some of those things. There's what's on the page and there's your inner life that mm -hmm. as time goes by. It's, um, 
easier to to sort of face that self when you when you're writing. At least that's mm-hmm. kind of what I'm hearing from you. Mm-hmm. It is. It's um, the whole time. It's been about you, mm-hmm. and it's very weird to not know that. <laughs> um, you know, or deflect from it, I should say. And I think that for me, it's been very arduous, painful, and ultimately joyful experience of saying, oh, I was there all along. I was, I saw that all along. And it's just an amazing feeling now to know that it was always you. I, uh poet I knew um, framed this sort of discussion in the idea of finding one's tiger face in mm-hmm. your reflection. And I always loved that, that, mm-hmm. that idea, but you, you've spoken to that so, so eloquently today. Yes. No, it's been, your questions have been so great. So <laughs> I'm only, I'm only as good as my interviewer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, question from the audience. Does the imposter syndrome ever go away? Oh, that's a great question. I had a, 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 a wonderful friend. I loved her very much. She passed away, but she often felt like an imposter. And I, I never heard anyone say it but me um, before. And, and um, I feel it less and less the more I admit to more and more to what I want and to what I want to achieve. So I feel it less and less. Um, I feel more and more connected to not deviating from what I want and from what I hope to achieve as a writer. And it's funny, it's sort of, that's so enormous that there's not a lot of room for the other stuff anymore. The hobgoblins in your head. Take up that space more with your work than with your fear. Another question from the audience asking, who are your current favorite authors? Oh. Well, I'm reading Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, so she's my favorite current author. Um, have you guys read that? It's amazing. And you've read it, Gwendolyn? It's been a long time, but yes, I have. Yeah. And um, uh I'm gonna read Passage to India next. I've been doing a sort of English uh, literature course um, just for fun and totally spontaneous with a friend of mine who teaches at Oxford. And so we read 30 pages a week of something. And um, so they're my favorite, but I've been um, very excited to read uh, Maggie Nelson's new book on freedom. Um, I love, Ocean Vong's poetry. Um, I love lots of people. Um, um, Lots of old writers (laughs) still make me very excited. Elizabeth Bishop is someone to read for detail and Marion Moore is someone to read for philosophy and um, so it's just, it's, there are a lot of people out there. And I almost also, um, I read by association, so if a writer mentions someone else, I'll read that person. Um, but I'm, I've been feeling very um, sluggish with reading because I've been writing, but I think it's important to keep both up. When you mentioned Jane Austen, I, you know, I took a deep dive into Jane Austen many years ago in grad, in grad school, just you know, loved her work and I think appreciated the, the formality of it and yeah. the, of course the the whole notion of the gaze and the yeah. highly structured society yeah but it's been a while and I'm wondering in the current state of the world what kind of counterpoint is Jane Austen as you're reading it right now to the world that we're in well actually the weird thing is is that she brings up so many issues in Mansfield Park that are so contemporary such as colonialism it's a big part of that book. And the, the uncle who goes to Antigua and he comes back and there's lots of conversations about colonizing things, whether it's gardens or people. Um, so she's 
she's pretty up there. I think a, a person that I would recommend for sure is Renata Adler's Speedboat um, for younger writers um, who are interested in fragments and how fragmented society looks. Um, so for sure, she's someone that I would read um, um, to understand why you feel disconnected. Um, and Austin talks about disconnection through anger, through Fanny's anger. And Renata Adler talks about it through um, actually showing you what it looks like on the page. Great recommendation, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So one of our audience members wants to know, what do you do for fun? <laughs> oh, I like to talk to you guys. Uh, I talk to you guys and um, I listen to music a lot. Um, I read. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question from our audience, a student asking, says, I've never been to New York City. Mm -hmm. She says, I've spent my whole life here in Spokane. Um, when you look out your window, what do you see? I can show you. Do you want to see it? Sure, that would be great. Okay. So this is my, uh, my office. And then that's the window. And it looks out onto my street, okay. um, which is a pretty quiet street in Soho. Um, and it has, uh, it's like these Georgian townhouses on one side and that's where I live and it's like three stories. And it's, um, Soho is a kind of restaurant and shopping area, but not overly populated. Um, and it's, they have little parks here and it's, um, it, it was a, a, a place where artists always live. And now of course, Artists are always replaced by rich people. Um, so there are many more rich than there are artists, but um, New York is a great walking city and you can walk it um, and go through many, many different kinds of neighborhoods in a day. Besides home, do you have a favorite place in the city? Um, any park, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have any more audience questions. I'm looking in both places and I don't see any. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you so much for, for spending some time with us this morning. This oh no, Gwendolyn, it was a treat for me. And, and if you come to New York, be in touch. All right. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Yes. And we'll see you this evening. Yes. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye.